to, to start with, but we're back on track. Um, tonight's program is titled French Children of the Holocaust. My name is Anne Mollengarden, and I am the Education Coordinator of the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center, or the BHEC. While the BHEC's focus remains education, education goes hand in hand with remembrance. And for it is what we learn from the past and those who are there that's going to shape our future. And although the Holocaust is a fairly recent historical event with amazing documentation, we are really only beginning to appreciate the vastness of its lessons. So for the BHEC, there's still a lot of work to be done. And as an educational nonprofit organization, we always appreciate your donation, so thank you. Um, by now, you're all familiar with the Zoom etiquette. We have muted all of you when you came in, um, so I will spare you all the descriptive how-tos. Um, but do remember to submit your questions in the chat box, both during and after the program, and then we will direct those to our speaker after the program and allow you to unmute yourselves individually as we call on you. So thank you for sticking with our protocol here. Tonight's program is the final in our series that was titled The Holocaust in Focus, in which we've been examining how photographs not only help us to recall memories, but often they become our primary source of memories. For the average person, the Holocaust was a German thing. Perhaps they're aware that the Holocaust reached into Poland and killed three million Jewish citizens and almost two million non-Jewish civilians. But how many are aware of the German invasion of France and the nuances of the events that occurred there? What of the refugees who fled to France from Germany trying to escape their Nazi occupiers? Did you know that when France was occupied, there were almost 350,000 French citizens, but another 75,000 resident Jews who did not hold French citizenship? How were these foreign Jews, as they call them, treated differently than the native Jews. And what was the difference between the Northern occupied France and the Southern Vichy France, which pursued a more vigorous anti-Semitic policy? And then in November of 1942, when the German troops occupied Vichy, Vichy's formerly free zone, what did that mean for the Jews who had sought refuge there? Tonight, we will explore the Holocaust in France using an amazing resource that Dr. Hulk was brought to my attention that's Serge Klarsfeld's book, French Children of the Holocaust, a Memorial. It's a collection of 2,500 images of children, French-born and foreign Jews, as they were called, whose fate was sealed when they were deported. Dr. Hulquist is a professor of modern European history and, and the interim chair of the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Montevallo. His research interests include the history of the French advertising profession and media in the 20th century. Dr. Hulquist has been an amazing friend of the BHEC, sharing his knowledge of the Holocaust with our teacher cadre and our community education participants whenever we've asked. We are so grateful for his time and his dedication in researching and teaching us from these new perspectives. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark Hulquist. Well, thank you. Uh, I can see the hands applauding. Of course, this is a mutual admiration society for a few moments. And my own personal history is roughly five and a half years ago, I got an email from Anne and it was prompted by uh, Logan Green, as some of you may know, uh, a former student of mine from some 15 years ago at, at the University of Montevallo. And he's been much involved with the BHEC and Holocaust education locally and in fact nationally. And so he connected me to Anne and told Anne, well, he might be interested in helping out the BHEC. And so over the last five and a half years, I think I've done five or six presentations and it's been so rewarding for me to meet all of you and meet some new people tonight. And, you know, I'd like to teach a lot and I like to certainly teach about this subject. And um, so I just want to thank you for your participation and attendance tonight. And then another uh, plug is that um, over the last year, and, and it's hard to believe it was the end of last February last year that the BHEC helped uh, bring uh, Deborah Lipstadt to Birmingham Southern and some of you in the audience were at that talk as was I and then we've had Zoom talks over the last 10 months and I've been able to attend talks by uh, 
Rabbi Stephen Jacobs, uh, Dr. Jonathan Wiesen at UAB, uh, more recently Brenda Hancock earlier this month. And so it's been really, really good for me just to add to my knowledge base in terms of Holocaust studies. So I'd like to thank Anne and the BHEC just for having all this really stupendous programming, especially during the pandemic over the last 10 months. And I'm again, honored to be part of it. Uh, then there's one more thing is that I was looking at the BHEC mission statements. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'm just gonna read part of it. Uh, by preserving and sharing the stories of local Holocaust survivors and commemorating the events of the Holocaust and the lives of those who perished, the BHEC seeks to promote a moral and ethical response to prejudice, hatred, and indifference for the benefit of all humanity. And I've thought a lot about this talk since maybe December, I can't recall, maybe November when we sort of decided I was going to do this. And I certainly think the subject matter certainly fulfills the BHEC mission statements. And I'm always glad to fulfill basically a statement. And before I start in just a moment, the last sentence is that uh, I think some of the other Holocaust and focus um, programs have been certainly about photographs, but in some sense, perhaps more German and or Nazi photographs. And most of tonight's presentation are, are not. They're going to be a, a sort of collective experience where Klarsfeld over a 15 to 20 year period of time is going to accumulate a lot of photographs from people all over Europe, certainly France, but other refugee families that were deported. And so I think that's in, in some sense an important statement to make that the, the, these photographs as we will see eventually represent a, a wonderful naturalism, but also the horrible tragedy basically within them. And historians you know, are supposed to be dispassionate about the subject, but there's no way tonight I can be dispassionate about a very emotional subject. And so I think I have some 15 to 16 photographs that I selected out of some 2000 within this very large tome. And, and certainly I'll, I'll ask Anne that maybe at some point I might even ask for questions on the fly for some of the photographs of anyone participating, because certainly I think some of the guests here tonight will be better at decoding some of the photographs than I will, but we, we can sort of negotiate that during uh, the presentation. So I guess I'm ready for a um, screen share here. And um, so hopefully I'll, I'll see if there's some nodding heads, if this is successfully shared with you. Good, thank you. And so I'll go to uh, the sort of full screen. So, so some of the photos here actually have been um, borrowed from my good friend, Judy Brisky. I think this one she gave me a few years ago when I uh, presented on Valdiv. So, you know, our title slide, French Children of the Holocaust, my name, etc. But the memorabilia, unfortunately, b behind you, behind you, behind the title, is basically French police cards in terms of the thousands and thousands of Jews in France who were victims basically of a census. And I'll talk about that census that first begins in October of 1940. And we certainly know in terms of how the Nazis operated or their collaborators, part of it was an information onslaught of getting the compliant victims basically to turn in their names, their addresses, their personal possessions. And we all know what's going to happen if those personal possessions are all going to be looted. Uh, another talk I gave last year, I was quoting the uh, German uh, writer uh, Klaus Mann, the son of Thomas Mann, and his fictional work called Mephisto, he describes the Nazis as the underworld, the underworld crying out for power. And it really is type, a type of organized crime within Europe. And so I'm going to just begin with a uh, roadmap, a, a, an overview of the next hour. We'll, we'll see how I do. And, and I'll put Anne as sort of my my warden. If I'm taking too long, I'll, I'll look to Anne to sort of do hand motions to speed up because I do have kind of a big mouth at times when I when I talk. And so we're going to talk about the book itself briefly. Uh, and then two, three, four, and five, as, as Anne had suggested in the introduction, just some historical context. And some of you know these stories really well and, and the historical background, but some people may not. And so uh, I'll try to do the best I can just to provide a, a sort of basic 
background into anti-Semitism in France, uh, the Jewish experience, and then Vichy France from 1940 to the middle of 1944. Uh, Roman numeral six will be selected images fr from the book, and again, thousands of them, and I just uh, choose. Though, in, in terms of images, I did try to choose a range in terms of, of gender, uh, Parisian, uh, rural French, uh, other areas of, of Europe where people, not just Germany, but from Ru Romania and Poland, other countries, refugees came into France in the 1930s. So I tried to have some amount of distribution. It's certainly not a scientific uh, distribution. Uh, and then we'll do a little brief um, summary in terms of aftermath and contemporary memorials. And then I have some resources. And if we don't get to get to resources, certainly uh, this will be posted, I believe, on the page, on the uh, BHEC page, and you can download this at your convenience. On, on the right is the uh, French version uh, of the book, uh, French Children of the Holocaust, but the cover is exactly the same, uh, the English version or the American version, except the title being in English. So let's talk about the uh, co-authors, uh, Serge and Beata Klarsfeld, that again, some of you may know about. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background. Part of it comes from the foreword to this book from Peter Hellman, who used to write for the New York Times and, and New York Magazine. And some of you may know of, of Serge and his wife as quote unquote Nazi hunters. So from the 1950s to the present, and Klarsfeld was born in 1935 in Romania. Part of his life has been dedicated to Nazi hunting, but he and his wife, as we'll, we will see, don't really prefer that term. Tragically, in Nice, in I believe in the summer of 1942, uh, Nazi forces knocked on the door of their home. His father Arno answered. The Klarsfeld children were hiding basically in a closet. Klarsfeld knew that if he said anything too much, the whole family would be taken away. So he basically gave himself up to the SS at the door to sacrifice himself for his children. And so he was taken to Auschwitz and murdered later that year in 1942. And, and that's just some context for what Hellman writes about within his foreworld. And so, as I said, Serge Klarsfeld and his wife Beata are best known to the public as Nazi hunters. It's a term they're not fully comfortable with since the restoration of the names and the faces of the victims is more important to them than the punishment of the murderers. And I certainly think this book sort of fulfills that legacy or very much fulfills this legacy, but there's, there's a little bit more I wanted to add from Hellman's uh, forward. As parents, we observe simultaneously our own aging and our children's blossoming. Our expectations for ourselves are gradually transferred to them. If we could put our bodies in the way of their pain, even trading our lives for theirs, we would do so, as Arno Klarsfeld had done, as I mentioned, in 1942. The parents of the children in this book could not do that. They were powerless even to preserve the memory of their children. This memorial book full of innocent faces accomplices that sacred task. And so from occasion, even during the historical background, I do sort of put in a few of the illustrations uh, from the book. And every illustration actually has a um, annotation to it. Some are longer than others. So almost any time you see an annotation, it is Klarsfeld's annotation, and it certainly is not my own. And so here's just the first picture. And I, I'm not, not going to read all of the text, but I'll just sort of summarize it. So this is Anna Messe and her two girls, Esther, born March 9th, 1930, and Sarah, born August 27th, 1928. They were arrested in Toul in the Corrèze, uh, a département in central France. Anna Messer had run a small needle workshop there. They were deported to Auschwitz on convoy 72, April 29th, 1944. And I think out of the some uh, 11,000 or so children that were deported, I think Klarsfeld's calculus basically uh, I hate to say confirms, but he basically reveals maybe 350 of them actually surrendered the deportations. 
Uh, you might also see the red hyperlink Convoy 72. So this is actually a live hyperlink to Klarsfeld's book, which has been digitized. And so in the resources, if you want to look at this later, I have the source which, where it's digitized and you can look at that in all 1500 pages. And so again, you get 15 pages today, but if you wish, you can certainly look at this uh, later. The book I think has been out of print for some 15 years. And I did look, for example, on Amazon and Abe and other used books. And I think it, it retails now for anywhere from 500 to $800 because there's very few copies on the open market. So as I mentioned, the next few slides, I just want to do a very, very quick overview of, of anti-Semitism in France from some point roughly in the mid 19th century up until the Second World War. And of course, anti-Semitism has many, many different sort of faces to it. There's many, many different types of Jewish experience in France. So this is just a start, an overview just to begin with. So some of what I say is obviously going to be a bit overly simplified. So part of the origins of a more modern anti-Semitism in France happens after France's defeat in 1871 uh, at the hands of the Prussians in the Austro, in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and 1871. And part of the defeat in war is for the losers basically to look for a minority population in France to blame for their losses. And oftentimes I talk to students about this and not, not just classes on the Holocaust, but other courses about various problems of modernity. Every society is always modernizing and there's always a tension in every society between what historians might call the pull of progress and the tug of tradition. So right now in our country, I'm not going to talk about anything political, but we are facing various modernization forces and other forces are not so much convinced this modernization is a good thing. Well, France during the middle of the 19th century is in the midst of a rapid modernization urbanization, industrialization, the move in 1871 to a republic, some more conservative forces in France are very uncomfortable with what they see as too rapid and too fast a modernization. And unfortunately, at times, a small minority population can be blamed basically for these forces of modernization. Being a small population, they cannot defend themselves or they cannot defend themselves very well. And, and this playbook, unfortunately, is repeated over and over again in either European or world history. So the defeat in war I just mentioned and the modernization process is, is leading to groups that feel, are feeling in France that, are, that they are losing out. So what one might call the traditional French right, or maybe the monarchist right, who since the French Revolution in 1789 have been losing more and more power, during the French Third Republic of 1871, they are, feel, they are feeling like they are losing even more power. And Jews are one group amongst many that they are blaming. Certainly as well, there's another long, long standing, somewhat conservative force in French history, and this is the French Catholic Church, who are especially concerned, not just about the Jewish population in France, but the increasing French secularization of society. And, and that's a whole other lecture and in the interest of time, I won't go there, but just be it said that two large, powerful conservative forces are very concerned about the Jewish population in France who are becoming more visible. And again, something I can't talk about in great detail, but French Jews have been given citizenship during the French Revolution and Napoleon. Some of them were starting to assimilate more and becoming more visible in French society. Therefore, persecution and intolerance begins to increase in this area. And so what we see, I'm getting to the point eventually, is that there's search for enemies with, with Jews as targets. But then this is something a few of you in the audience know as part of my specialty is the history of the mass media and to a lesser extent advertising. We start to see what can be called a penny press 
newspapers because of the increase in reproductive capacities are becoming incredibly cheap. More and more people, even lower classes, are able to afford newspapers or pamphlets. And so we start to see what we would even call today a mass media with unfortunately anti-Semitic publications. And, and you see an example uh, to the right here, uh, the, the cover piece of the most horrible and vitriolic anti-Semitic French publication in the 1880s by Edouard Drummond. And it was called La France Juive, the Jewish France. Two volumes, I think about a thousand pages, horrible, horrible writing. It basically calls Jews economic en enemies of the true French, religious enemies, racial enemies. And uh, it also has a list of French names of Jewish people that he declares are enemies of the French state. It has very, very high uh, reprint numbers. I think it's reprinted for the next 30 years and it sells tens and tens if not hundreds of thousands. And so this, is, this was one of, of many different ways. This is not the only anti-Semitic French publication, but certainly it begins, begins to take root and certainly back to that French monarchist right, the Catholic Church, or maybe even a conspiratorial class in France. And again, I'm not going to make contemporary political allusions as well at this time. Uh, a quotation that's not from our book, but from a uh, retired emeritus professor of history at Cambridge University, uh, Richard Evans. Uh, he writes, and, and this is maybe 2010 or so, a historian once speculated on what would happen if a time traveler from 1945 arrived back in Europe and just before the First World War and told an intelligent and well-informed contemporary that within 30 years a European nation would make a systematic attempt to kill all of the Jews in Europe and exterminate nearly six million in the process. In other words, a counterfactual time travel. If the time traveler invented the contemporary to guess which nation it would be, the chances were that he would, ha would have pointed to France where the Dreyfus Affair had recently led to a massive outbreak of virulent popular anti-Semitism. And so there's his name and title. And some of you may know this is a magisterial three-volume uh, work, The History of the Third Reich, the first of three. Historians are never supposed to do counterfactuals, and then they do them anyway. And so I'll just leave this for what it's worth. But I think part of it is part of the point I'm trying to sort of make tonight that before the Great War, anti-Semitism in France, which had existed before 1870, is becoming potentially of near epidemic proportions. And then again, a, a, another photo from, from uh, Klarsfeld, and this is the May family. Uh, Andrea was the only survivor of the family. Uh, she was the daughter of Simone and Suzanne, like her sisters. She was born in Strasbourg. Lillian, age 15, was the oldest. Andrea, 14, the second child. Uh, in the top right in Solange, the youngest, uh, arrested in the Vosges uh, mountains in, in basically eastern France near Alsace-Lorraine where they had fled. The May family was deported on April 13th, 1944 on Convoy 71. And, and we would look at this photo, it's, it's the typical sort of family circle photo but also we see by the father wearing the Star of David which French authorities uh, required Jews to wear by 1941. This photo was not taken before the war. So this was taken during the German occupation of France. Most of the other photos we see were probably in the late 30s, early 40s, right before uh, the war itself. So I wanted to have one slightly later in the time period here. So one more slide on, on anti-Semitism. And so if the first slide was sort of 19th century, this is late 19th century up to 1939. And of course, the most important incident that Richard Evans uh, mentions was the Dreyfus Affair, which I'll summarize in one sentence, a French Alsace, Al Alsatian, a French Alsatian captain in the French army was framed for passing military secrets to the Germans. He did not. He was framed. He was tried. He was found guilty. He was sent to Devil's Island. 
eventually evidence comes out that potentially clears his name. He's brought back from Devil's Island. He's put on trial again. He's found guilty, but with extenuating circumstances, which doesn't make sense to me. Uh, eventually, Dreyfus uh, accepts, in some sense, his guilt for the promise of a presidential pardon because he could not bear going back to the hell of Devil's Island. Uh, eventually, he's going to be cleared by the French army in 1906. But actually, it's not until 2006 that Jacques Chirac, a hundred years later, actually has the sort of final say of actually saying Dreyfus was not guilty. It takes a long time uh, for justice to be rendered. So the point of the Dreyfus affair, though, is that it was quite symbolic of anti-Semitism in France, but not just anti-Semitism in France, all over Europe. This was a media affair. It was a media spectacle. Papers all over Europe reported on it. Anti-Semitic papers were gleeful to, to them. This confirmed that Jews could not be trusted. And in fact, I, I want to fast forward uh, to the next slide. A somewhat famous uh, political cartoon by Caron Dash in, in the French newspaper Le Figaro, which still is, is published. And, and this is entitled uh, The Family Dinner, and it, the publication, publication date is 13th February. Uh, the father is basically instructing the family, above all, don't talk about the Dreyfus affair because it's such a contentious issue within families, within neighborhoods, within the whole country. Everyone had an opinion upon the Dreyfus affair, and it was very binary. You, either he was innocent or he did not. And then the second, and there's just two images in this two panel cartoon was they talked about it. Therefore, the family basically fought and couldn't get along, et cetera. And again, it's not necessarily amusing at all if you think about the anti-Semitism in France in that era, but certainly it's, it's representative of the incredible deep divides in France the anti-Semitism that the Dreyfus Fair basically encapsulates and it continues for the next 30 to 40 years in France, at least for the, the boundaries of my presentation. So the, the next several points are all about immigration in France. And, and this is a point I'll tell my students when, when I'm teaching a straight up French history class and they're somewhat suspicious of me, not in a bad way, but I'll say France for the last 200 years has been the United States of Europe in the sense of immigration, that France basically has accepted, maybe not proportionally, but in sheer numbers, the greatest amount of immigrants in Europe. Uh, not particularly a melting pot of immigration. I prefer to see it more of a, as a mosaic, if that makes sense. And so we'll talk about the Jewish experience in this era within massive immigration that's coming into France during this period, the 1890s on. Uh, some of you may know, in terms of, of other historical events, especially because of Russian pogroms in Eastern Europe within the pale of settlement, many Eastern European Jews are either going to the United States or Canada, South America, Australia, or they're not going as far afield. They're going either to Germany or they're going to France. So many French Jews for the previous two, three, 400 years had been, I hate to say naturalized, but they had been somewhat naturalized French citizens. Now we have for the first time in the 1890s, uh, Eastern European Jews who were not the same in terms of types of religious practices, in terms of appearances, in terms of cultural behaviors. And so some Jews, especially in Paris, where many of them settled, were becoming more visible than they had been for the previous hundred years. And as you may know, visibility oftentimes bring with, brings with it, sadly, intolerance, danger, and persecution. Moving along, because I have to move along uh, efficiently, uh, there's going to be another wave of immigration in the 1920s. And as you may know, France lost so many men and also women uh, in the Great War, and also because of the pandemic is that French, the French had what demographers would call a population shadow. They had a shortage of young people. So France actually began to eagerly welcome refugees or immigrants, especially from Italy, Portugal, and Spain. Uh, and, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but certainly it's hundreds of thousands, but also immigrants again from Eastern Europe. 
And so many of the immigrants were non-Jewish, but there certainly was a significant number again in this next wave of immigrants. And just like the immigrants of the 1890s, it takes them a while to be assimilated. And, and again, we can talk about assimilation later. Well, the problem then for all this immigration is the 1930s and the Great Depression. And then this is a time of finger pointing, a time of economic downturn, a time of job shortages. Immigrants are now being blamed for taking jobs away from native French people, either male or women. Uh, a great, great chapter in, in the book by the late French historian Eugene Weber called The Hollow Years. It's not in my bibliography, but if you're interested in reading a very brief, very perceptive chapter on immigration in France and French attitudes to foreigners, not just Jews, but others, I, I urge you, and you can ask me later um, for the attribution for this. So anyway, anti-immigration sentiment increases. And of course, it's not just France. In the United States, there's an increase in anti-immigration sentiment in the 1930s. And we know that's part of the reason that the uh, people in the SS St. Louis were turned away in the late 1930s. And so we're nearly to the last part of the slide, but the late 1930s, uh, because of the Nazis in Europe, but also um, the Anschluss of Austria, uh, the takeover of Austria and the Sudetenland in the late 1930s, we start to see an, a new influx of Jewish refugees, basically from Eastern Europe to France. And we're gonna talk about many of these people who were sadly going to be caught up in the net of either the SS or the Vichy French police. They're so new to their circumstances when they arrive in Paris. They don't know the language, they don't know connections, they don't know people who can help them, and sadly many of them are going to be swept up and taken to extermination camps such as Auschwitz. And so, as Anne had mentioned earlier in her introduction, the French Jewish population in this era from the time of Dreyfus up to the time of the Second World War is going to more than double. And so that's going to increase anti-Semitic sentiments as well. It's going to justify from their warped perspective, their anti-Semitic ideas. And you've already seen that. So very briefly, and I'm not gonna talk about any of the battles of the Second World War. I'm sure you're happy about that so I can get to the main subject tonight. Well, we know France loses in about six weeks. So the war begins in May 10th. By June 18th, France uh, surrenders. And as Anne had mentioned, uh, there should be two zones of France, uh, the Southern free sort of Vichy zone and the Northern German occupied zone. And eventually by 1942, the Germans will invade and take over both North and Southern zones. And so oftentimes we refer informally to France in this period as Vichy France. It's only known as that because that's where the seat of government is moved from Paris to Vichy. Uh, Vichy was a spa. Uh, let's say in south central France where there are hot waters for baths and I'm not trying to be disrespectful but it's like if the seat of government in Washington DC moved to uh, Hot Springs Arkansas and it's, it's not a horrible analogy because it's far away it's a relatively small town and it's kind of hard to get to and so it's it's somewhat unusual but from the print for the French perspective, that's going to work for them. So the name of government does not change. It is just called Vichy France. It's still known as the Third Republic or the Etat Francaise uh, for the rest of the war. Vichy France though, from my perspective, and I'll, I will pronounce judgment, it was a vile, vile, horrible regime. Oftentimes it's been labored by the historian Robert Paxton and others as revenge of the anti-Dreyfusards. In other words, the horrible people, anti-Semitic and others who thought Dreyfus was a criminal, it's their revenge now for Dreyfus eventually being cleared in 1906. They're going to take France back for the French. And uh, many of these people aren't incredibly talented. Uh, they're put in power by other loathsome individuals. And sorry for my, all my editorial comments uh, basically here. And, and, and we have a headline from uh, the French newspaper Le Matin from October of 1940, uh, when the Vichy government first starts to pass Jewish laws depriving 
any Jews in, in France of their citizenship. And as you know, in other countries, uh, the same thing is going to happen is that bit by bit, uh, citizenship will be taken away from them until eventually there's nothing left for them. So, so specifically, I think this is the last historical slide and, and we'll get to the images, but just to discuss uh, Vichy France proper, the person quote unquote in charge of the French state was Maréchal Pétain, uh, a great World War I hero, a, a French general in his late 19, in his late 70s and 1940. So he will rule France along with the prime minister, Pierre Laval, uh, at this period of time. Um, his excuse, and oftentimes it's called the sword versus shield sort of debate. So Bataan basically signs the uh, Treaty of the Germans in June 1940, basically in some sense giving up French sovereignty. But his way of dealing with this to the French public is that he could not defend France with his sword anymore. The war is over, France will not fight, Germany has won. And, and to the perspective of money in 1940, no one knew that Germany was going to, going to be stopped. We know now what's going to happen after the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. So Batan says, I cannot be your sword, I shall be your shield. I will protect you, French men and French women, to the best of my abilities from Nazi aggressions. And of course, we know he failed as the sword, but he miserably fails at times as a shield. And certainly tonight's lecture is perhaps the worst example of failing as a shield of the deportation of over 11,000 French children to be murdered. And so over and over again, we see from 1940 to 1944, uh, the Vichy regime basically catering to the needs of the Nazis, either Hitler directly or indirectly. And I won't go into the politics of this, uh, Patan is trying to get things like French POWs returned to France, uh, a lessening of, of German economic res restrictions upon the French, and basically Patan basically gets nothing. He fails, he fails as a sword and he basically fails as a shield. The Nazis had no interest in dealing with the French as an equal power. They were defeated, they were subjected. You basically do, this is the Nazi policy, what we tell us to do. And so the sword failed and also the, sh the shield failed. Uh, from a larger perspective, as we get ready to, to look at our images today, just for perspective, as I mentioned, the Soviet Union will be invaded by Nazi Germany in June of 1941. And this, be this begins what we will eventually see and know in the long run, the large scale extermination uh, process. Some of you may know Marshall Goering's sort of order in, in the summer of, of, of 19. 41, basically seeking for, for a solution to the Jewish problem in Europe. And then we, we start to see in, in small scale, the first exterminations at Auschwitz, basically experiments and how and what they could do, what formerly had been just a, a riding camp for the Polish uh, cavalry, cal cavalry, excuse me. Uh, summer of 1942, from a larger context, uh, Adolf Eichmann, who's basically the transportation minister, is going to summon Western Europe European government officials and French agents to begin coordinate sending Jews to Auschwitz. So up to this point, any deportations in France had been somewhat informal now by the summer of 1942, leading to events like Valdiv, where we're going to see a formalized uh, transportation and deportation and basically the murdering of many of these people. And again, sadly, from our perspective tonight, uh, children uh, at Auschwitz. Um, uh, an identity card, and, and this comes again from, from, from our book tonight, uh, uh, a cart of a foreign identity. So this was someone, a, a, a Jewish young man who was not born in France, but came in the 1930s. And basically this card shows not only he's, he's Jewish, but also from the French police perspective, he is not French. Uh, and I'm not going to read the text there for you now. Um, later, some of these I'll read in, in greater detail. And so the last slide, as I promise, on historical background is um, act after act that is anti-Semitic in nature. And, and, and certainly some of you are familiar with what has happened in Poland just a year earlier, 1939, 1940. 
where the acts become more and more restrictive and more and more vicious basically over time. And so I'm not gonna list all of them, but, but the first was a German decreed census that uh, the newspaper Le Matin mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago. And of course, this is all part of the underworld crying out for power is that the census uh, required the Jewish populations, French or non-French, to list their names, their addresses, professions, places of birth at local police headquarters. And we all know what this is going to lead to not. next. It's information for roundups basically in the future or the looting basically of their property. Uh, especially the, these, just like this identity card suggests, were for targeting foreign Jews in France but then eventually by 1942, 43 and 44, it's not just going to be the foreign Jews, it's going to be quote unquote, native French born Jews that'll be targeted uh, as well. And so, as I mentioned, 1941, 1942, there'll be even more stringent laws, stripping away more and more citizenship, uh, not be able to serve in government, not to be teachers, uh, army veterans, people who had won the Legion of Honor, just like in Germany, those who won the Iron Cross, who happened to be Jewish, they would be stripped of their military uniforms and military ranks. And so, what some historians will call this is an informal ghettoization process. France is not going to have formalized ghettos like we will see in Eastern Germany or within Poland, but we will see in some sense an informal ghettoization uh, process where Jews in France are not going to be citizens. Certainly it starts in 1940 and certainly by 1941, I don't think one would consider any Jew to actually have any type of citizenship rights in France uh, as well. And so then I mentioned looting of property. And then this also happens, and, and we see this all throughout Europe within the Holocaust, some French Vichy officials or police forces, etc., will actually go over and beyond Nazi rules, Nazi strictures, Nazi policies. Part of it perhaps is their own in, inherent anti-Semitism, but part of it is to please their superiors in some sense. They're, they're looking for uh, uh, ration card bonuses. They're looking for extra pieces of coal. They're looking potentially for promotion. And we know this also happens with, within Germany. We know what happens within the SS. Uh, and we also know sadly that it happens in France uh, in, from 1940 to 1944. And so the last, before I get, and there's always a last thing, there can't be any more uh, pixels left here, is that anti-Semitism, unfortunately in France, has been increasingly normalized by 1941, 1942, that there are no pro-Semitic publications, if this makes sense. The major French press media outlets, the, the very small amount of radio that was broadcast at this time, anti-Semitic messages become the norm. And, and certainly many French perhaps are not anti-Semitic themselves, but certainly they get nudged, not in some sense to help, to help or assist or to aid their Jewish brothers and sisters. Though again, there's many, many, many examples of heroic French citizens. And if I have time later, I may mention that, but I probably won't have time to do this. Uh, a map which uh, I took from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and you may have here seen some of their really good series of maps. And so this map gives you a sort of a larger sense of the various camps all over France. And this is not a universal map. I have another map later. I probably won't show you, but it's in my resources. There's actually hundreds and hundreds of, of camps. Some of them are very small, but they're all camps that accumulate Jewish populations. And then they're sent to larger camps and larger camps. Uh, the most infamous on this map is right outside uh, Paris at the top. It's Drancy, basically a suburb today of Paris. It, it had been a barracks in some sense for military forces. So many Jews will sadly be sent there and that's the last place in France they will be before they are sent to Auschwitz uh, to be murdered uh, from 1941 on. Uh, as I'd shown you on the title page earlier, uh, this is from the Shoah Memorial in Paris. And so these are the police files of, of recording the names as a result of the 1940 census of sadly many people who are going to be victims to various roundups.
So there's the big so, and and and, and I thank you for your polite uh, attention for that long. Maybe it was overly long, but it's too late now. Uh, and so we, we have some select images here, and and I don't know if I should ask or not, but because we have several images, should I? ask if people want to talk about any of these individual images or should we wait until I'm done with the next six slides and have people say, go back to that slide, go back to that slide, etc. I would have asked you before seven o'clock, but because of our technical issues, I didn't have time for that. So I think um, if you do have a question on a particular image, if you would put it in the chat and then I will recognize you and you can, um, I, and then you can unmute yourself or I'll just ask your question, that would probably be the best. Maybe right now, I'll just ask your question, but put it in the chat section. Thank you, Anne, that, that's, a, that's a, a wise um, solution to this. And so, as I mentioned in my introduction long, long ago, that I, I, I just tried to choose some selection of photos, not to have all the same age, not have all the same gender, et cetera, and, or, or the sort of background. <laughs> And so this is Haim Paraya, and I'll, I probably did not pronounce his last name correctly, but he was a Greek Jew, Greek Jew, born in Salonika on August 8th, 1926. He was arrested during the roundup of Greek Jews in, in France on November 5th, 1942, and then four days later deported on Convoy 45. He lived at 54 Rue de Lafayette in Paris, and I'm pretty sure that's in the ninth arrondissement, sort of close to the sort of Galerie Lafayette and the sort of uh, uh, Tony uh, shopping district. Part of the reason I, ch I chose this was the, the horrible, horrible contrast in, in, in terms of what eventually is going to happen. So, you know, it's, it's a beach vacation, you know, playing in the sand. Uh, I'm not sure what that stick necessarily is or, or, or the wooden object in his hands, if it's part of an umbrella or a support, et cetera, perhaps changing rooms basically behind him, uh, a proud parent, perhaps a mother or a father, or maybe an older sibling uh, taking this photo of him. Uh, if, if he was born in 1926, the photo is not dated, but I will just guess, perhaps 10 years old, uh, 1936. And, and certainly I think in terms of the type of charge that Serge Klarsfeld has in terms of memorializing, well, how can one in some sense, and maybe I'm overdoing it, but maybe get more innocent or as innocent as this photo, you know, sort of celebration, youth, no worries and no cares of the world. And then three years later, perhaps five years later, all of that is going to be taken away from him. So maybe let's pause. Go ahead, Ann. Could you address um, where they got these pictures? Most of them are family donations. And so, you know, this is pre-internet. The book is published in 1996. I know the internet exists, but I, I don't think that these were internet submissions. People weren't scanning photos probably much at this time. So Klarsfeld basically puts out a call in terms of either Paris or European contacts if people would like to donate basically personal photographs uh, of relatives and oftentimes sadly the parents had not survived but oftentimes photographs still remain somewhere someplace in family possessions and so it really is as you know today we might call this the, the work of the hive people coming together for a collective purpose this photo in particular i don't know and I don't think any of the photos that I know, there's an attribution of how he received them. Maybe, maybe at the end of the 2000 page book, but I don't think I saw that. Okay, so I'll go on uh, to the next uh, photo. And again, they're all just heartbreaking and, and heartrending. And if I get overly emotional again, I'll apologize, but perhaps I shouldn't apologize. Uh, so this is, uh, Janine Ujalvo, who was born on September 4th, 1940. So she was born three months roughly after the invasion of France and after the French surrender. Uh, she lived in the 11th arrondissement. Uh, she was deported with her mother Rebecca on convoy 75 on May 30th, 1944. So 
four years of age. And again, if you want to click on, on the hyperlink, it actually will take you to the digitized list of people who are, were on the convoy. So this is part of Klarsfeld and others' works, other, the work of others to document as well as they possibly can every convoy that was taken from France and goes mostly to Auschwitz. So some were certainly taken to other camps, uh, certainly, as you know. I'll, I'll show the second photo, and then if there's any on both of them, I'll, I'll open them basically for questions. So this was Charles Malmed, who was five uh, when he was deported. Uh, he was born and lived in Compiègne in the Oise, just north of Paris, maybe 15 miles or so. Uh, he left all alone for Auschwitz in Convoy 66 of January 20th, 1944. And just to think in the larger context of January 20th, 1944, German forces are, especially in Eastern Europe, are being pressed back by the Soviets. Uh, we're roughly five and a half months until D-Day and the American sort of invasion. At this point, France is, is wholly under the, the control of the Nazis, both north and south occupation zones. And so Malmed was French born. And in fact, uh, um, Janine was French born as well. So again, as I had mentioned earlier in 1940, 1941, some of the targets were those who had not been born in France, but certainly increasingly we're going to see French born uh, targets being taken away and, and sadly murdered. And again, I'll, I'll just comment, uh, you know, just the look on these faces, the sort of innocence, uh, the sort of pride, uh, the flowers for, for Janine on the left. And, and again, maybe I don't want to read too much uh, into these, but I look at them and I just I just think of how important the mission is of, of Scherz Klarsfeld or even on a much, much minor level, what I'm trying to do tonight is, is continue to memorialize, memorialize these people and their names that certainly uh, should not be forgotten. Uh, Blanche and Gerard Picard were born in Colmar in, in the east of France, but 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 France at this when they were born uh, on August 1st, 1929 and September 31st, those are dates of their births. They were arrested in La Salle in the Vosges Mountains uh, in eastern France, and they were deported of their parents on Convoy 71 of April 13th, 1944. So seven weeks maybe before the D-Day invasions, the roundups, the convoys uh, are basically still continuing. I'll just pause in case Anne gets a chat question. I'm not demanding chat questions, but I just wanna be um, polite in case someone has anything to mention in terms of the, the items, the background. Okay, I'll we'll go on from there. Um, Solange Peak was born on March 10th, 1938 in Paris in the 12th arrondissement. Uh, she lived in, in 245 Rue des Pyrenees. She and her mother were arrested while they were trying to cross the demarcation line and were transferred to the Pithivier camp. And, and you may have seen in some of those police cards in my introduction, it was the Pithivier camp. Her mother was deported on convoy 11 from Pithivier. Solange followed from her at Drancy, and Drancy was that camp just to the north of Paris on, on Convoy 24th on August 26, 1942, uh, scarcely four years old and, and, and sent away basically, uh, sadly and tragically, to be murdered by the Nazis. Could you address why or what the rationale, if there was one, that the children were separated from the parents for transports in some cases. I think, and, and this is supposition on my part, was easier to control the children and perhaps to get the parents away from them. So the parents in some sense could not overly protect the children, maybe engage in acts of violence. Other people you know, might have better answers than that, but that would be my sort of supposition to keep them separate in terms of easier control by the French police. But also maybe part of it is, is to, it's just cruelty. It's 
how especially cruel to the parents could this be? I mean, I, I think, you know, some of these horrible people, there's just no bounds to which they will descend. So perhaps part of that, that could have been part of the equation as well as cruelty to the victims. Um, oh. I have some text here, but the text doesn't come from the image, but I'm, I'm bringing up the text just to try to make a, a larger point. So this is Maurice Mandel Mildinet. He was born in Paris in 1928. He was 14. Uh, his brother Bernard was 15. Both were deported on Convoy 24 in 1942. They lived in the 20th arrondissement. This picture was taken at Maurice's bar mitzvah on October 28th, 1941. So I'm reading something here that I found elsewhere, but I thought it was somewhat applicable in terms of what we what we were discussing. Uh, I will never forget the faces of the children. They are serious, profound, and what is extraordinary in these little faces, the horror of the days which they're living is branded. They have understood everything like adults. They show us their most precious belongings the pictures of their mothers and fathers, which their mothers gave them when they parted. Hence what, what you had just asked a few minutes ago about the separation of them. Hastily, the mothers wrote a tender inscription. We all have tears in our eyes. We imagine that tragic instant, the immense pain of the mothers. And so again, this is John C. Uh, this is a French Jewish prisoner who did survive, who was able to write down her rem reminiscences of camps like drawn C. And you might, if you're interested, you could look up her own particular story. And so when I read this, and you know, I, I, I looked at Maurice's faces or, or Odette's or, or Solange faces in terms of serious, profound, ex extraordinary. And of course, none of these photos are in camps like drawn C. So the horror is not yet there. But the tragedy for us as viewers or, or viewers at any time, you know, 10 or 100 years from now, as that we all know, unfortunately, the tragedy that's going to be coming shortly uh, to these victims. So Pam King had commented that perhaps the children were sent off first to break the morale of the parents, which is what you alluded to. Yes. And then Logan Green commented on that first picture of the little girl with the flowers at the professional level of the photograph. Um, you know, this, this was probably a very prized possession of the family. Yes, and, and in both you can see the studio name. It may it may be hard to see in a screen share, but at the bottom left, and I can't it's Carlay on the right. It's 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 way too blurry, but some of these do have. So Logan's correct. Uh, you know, middle maybe upper middle class, but even even lower class occasionally that they could afford. It would be a prized possession. It would be a it would be a big opportunity to get a staged photograph within a studio. But certainly, and, and the sort of French bourgeoisie would be much more standard uh, to have these as, as memory items. But, and here as well, you can see also the studio name uh, to the right of, of Solange's uh, feet there. This letter is matched to the image. And so the letter is reproduced in Klarsfeld's work. M most of the... Um, Images only have an attribution as you've seen, but maybe one in 30 or 40 will have a longer selection. So this is a letter smug, smuggled out of the camp of Bon Le Roland from, from Sonia. And, and it's a much longer letter. I just wanted to give uh, at least parts of it uh, to you to give you a sense. My dear uncle, I beg you, and of course the uncle is not uh, in the camp, he, he is free. I beg you prepare a package as soon as possible of our clothes because we are leaving. Even if we're not among the first to go, we are still leaving. And my mom has nothing to wear, David the same, and my skirt is in tatters. Try to alert Madame Seguin or someone else, but try to send us everything you can and we'll return the favor as soon as we're able. Try to send me stockings or socks because I'm barefoot. I have nothing. Try to do everything you can with food. Send only fruit because they take away all canned goods and macaroni. And so, again, I, I could read more into this, but part of this is probably many people in the camps never were able to smuggle out letters. Many people in the camps, like a drawn C, they might only be there two or three days. And so they were probably a bone a little bit longer and able to get a letter out. 
but from what we know, what we know none of these four actually were able to um, uh, survive uh, the events afterwards. And in fact, they had been born, and, and, and I'm sorry, my, my screen had covered the attribution. Uh, they were born in Ludge, which some of you are familiar with the Ludge Ghetto, one of the last ghettos to be closed, uh, I believe in 1943 or 1944. And they were part of the Valdiv Roundup uh, of July, mid-July, the 16th and 17th, 1942. Uh, one last particular image, and then there'll be some peripheral images, and I'll get ready to, to sum up. And so this text is also within the um, uh, uh, Klarsfeld uh, book. And so Sarah Lickstein was actually at Veldiv, but she was able to survive. She escaped uh, in some sense by accident, I guess I might say. So she, she is recounting later, a policeman comes up to me and asks, what are you doing here? I say, I'm not Jewish, I came to see someone. The policeman responds, get out of here, you can come back tomorrow, he says. Glancing to one side, I see my mother smiling, relieved. She's overheard. I leave coat over my shoulders and slowly cross the street. I take Rue Nakar across from the Valdiv and follow it, not daring to turn around, trembling at the thought that someone might come shouting after me, and with a heavy heart because of having left Maman. At the end of the street, a policeman is barring anyone from going through. My heart is pounding, but it lets me pass, thinking I live in one of the buildings on that street. I walk for a long time until I work up the courage to enter a metro station and change my hundred franc note to buy a ticket. My mother had told me to go to, go to some French friends. They would hide me. When I go downstairs into the station, I see my mother. She had escaped half an hour after me. Without a word, we run to the apartment of our friends who receive us with tears and close the doors behind us. And I'm sorry for historical context. I've mentioned Valdiv a number of times and I perhaps should have mentioned it. Valdiv was a former bicycle arena, which has now been destroyed or torn down. Uh, in a French police action, it wasn't a Nazi or SS action, thousands of French Jews were rounded up many of them, quote unquote, non-French citizens. Uh, five to 6,000 were sent to Drancy, and I think well over 95% of them were basically murdered and sent to Auschwitz. So it, it was the largest, I think we could say, singular French roundup during the Holocaust. And so that's why, in particular, I brought up this slide, but I also brought up this particular image because she is one of the few in terms of the some 2,000 images who were able to, who were able to survive uh, the events from 1940 to 1945. This just reminds me, and, and his name will appear in a second at the bottom of, of the little boy at the beach. So this little boy, four or five, six, I'm not particularly fantastic sometimes of ages, has his little toy hoop, uh, certainly stopped within, shot within a French studio, and he will not survive. And so this is Maurice, who lives in Paris. Uh, he was a friend of, of someone who did survive, uh, Milo Adune, who survived convoy number 38, who drew the attention to the case of Maurice and gave the photographs. So if someone had asked, where do some of the photographs come from? It comes from a friend, not a family member who survived. And so uh, Serge Klarsfeld was never able to trace Maurice to any of the deportation lists. So what I have is some data, and I don't want to do too many numbers, but some of you may have seen this. I'm just trying to make a larger point. But it lists the major European countries and a rough sort of accounting uh, of the Jewish population who ended up surviving the events of 1939 to 1945. And so I just put France in a little box with red just for context. So some countries like Denmark did a better job, if you want to call it even a job, of protecting the Jewish population, where, where others uh, like the Baltic states did not. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to give a lecture on how and why, but people oftentimes will ask about France and, and why in some sense did the French, and again, I hate to give it a qualitative assessment. I'll, I'll just say why, why did only 30% not survive? And, and, and part of it is just size. Part of it is France has a lot of places to hide. France actually also bordered on two neutral countries, Switzerland and Spain, in which friendly people perhaps could get others out. 
France actually had, especially as the war continued, a larger resistance group that would help basically uh, French and non-French Jews basically escape. Uh, there, there are other instances, I could talk about Jew Jewish relief organizations as well. So there, there, it's a very large equation, but that's why most historians would say in general that a somewhat higher percentage of French Jews survived compared to the countries uh, basically uh, below. So some summation here, and then you know, certainly any questions you might may have. And so as opposed to percentages, just sort of raw numbers in terms of 340,000 Jews in France in 1940, uh, 72,500 uh, were murdered, uh, 11,405, 11,000 450 children were deported. And I think Klarsfeld estimates only 300 of those 11,000 actually survived. Um, most French perpetrators of this, French police forces, the milice, the militia, others, uh, and I'm talking about post-World War II, escaped major sanction. I could talk about that later or why, but again, probably I shouldn't for time. Sadly, many of the upper level perpetrators escaped or had re resistance credentials by the end of the war that in some sense gave them sort of cover for being tried basically for crimes or they escaped abroad. So Klaus Barbie, who was known as the Butcher of Lyon, eventually fled certainly with US government help and he was in some sense an informal US government asset in the immediate post-war World War II period, he goes to Bolivia, eventually uh, Serge Klarsfeld and Beata, you know, with the help of others, track him down. They bring him back to France. He's put on trial. He is convicted, found guilty, and he serves the last four years of his life in prison. But all too many people, and I'm being judgmental as a historian, estate, escaped sanction for their crimes during the Second World War. Uh, more recently, this hyperlink, I will not click on that because I'll probably mess up my screen share, uh, but the French uh, President uh, Macron uh, in 2017 produced the largest denunciation of French state complicity in the Holocaust. So 20 years earlier, uh, Jacques Chirac had, had given a type of apology but sort of didn't in some sense blame the French state. Macron, from my perspective, is given the fullest, most comprehensive denunciation and or apology for French actions. And then the right, you have an image uh, of a relatively new monument memorial, uh, four years old now, 2017, and, and Père Lachaise Cemetery, the most uh, famous and large cemetery, cemetery in Paris. There, there's other, uh, memorials to the Holocaust there. In fact, directly next to this memorial to children is the uh, memorial to Monomic Auschwitz, the Buna. But I didn't want to put too many images of memorials. So you can click on this article. It's from the Jerusalem Post. Uh, and Harold Pollack, a, a professor at the University of, of Chicago, I found this on his blog. And I, I always want to credit people with their photos, not my photos. So if you happen to make it to Paris, a very moving memorial. So um, I don't know if you can translate the wording on the memorial. Yes, um, to the memory of the Jewish children murdered. Uh, sorry, I have to move your screen here. To the Jewish children murdered by the Nazis uh, and the memory uh, of their only, um, and their memory of this tomb basically, or their sepulcher. I didn't, I didn't translate that too well on the fly, but it's a memorial to the children murdered by the Nazis and to their memory. But it's interesting that it's murdered by the Nazis. There's not yes. any French responsibility there. It, exactly. That they're, they're just accessories to the crime. So again, it's, it's, it's sort of not taking full responsibility basically for their crimes. So a couple of comments just to share right now. Um, yes. Catherine Boris Brown shared in the chat that in Timothy Snyder's book, The Black Earth, he goes into depth on why some of the countries succeeded in saving more Jews than others. And then Justin Bozeman shared, would it be within reason to assume that groups like Bader Meinhof would not have had as much appeal 
if Nazis and Nazis accomplice, accomplices were punished at a higher rate by the representative democracies that inherited their aftermath. I would say that's a reasonable supposition. So I know the mid 1970s, the quote unquote Bider Meinhof game, Bider, Bader Meinhof game begins to engage in acts of terrorism in West Germany and other places. And so I would say, yes, I mean, that's my belief is that they're sort of encouraged by the lack of retribution or punishment for high level criminals or medium or even low level criminals. And, and that's from my perspective. And then Heather West shared that that last line on that monument is translated, your memory is their only tomb. Thank you. Uh, this is from the preface of Serge Klarsfeld, so of the book itself. And again, sorry for my long reading of quotes for you, but I think it's, it's my way to conclude, which is probably a key word for many of you. More than 50 years have passed since the murders of these beautiful children, for they are all beautiful in my eyes, who once played in the streets of Paris, Marseille, Lyon, Nice, and other French cities and villages. It has taken so long for many people in France to confront what happened here to these children from our neighborhoods and towns and cities. And perhaps it is time to share this with others so they may know how these terrible events happened and come to know some of the young victims arrested in the streets, if you will, you will find if you visit France. This book is born of my obsession to be sure that these children will not be forgotten. And, and, and the last image from the book, of, of Michel, who was born in 1932 in Paris, who was deported with his father in Convoy 34 on September 18th, 1942. So I, I have, in my sort of rough conclusion here, I, and this is why I have Klarsfeld's quote, a much, much smaller and less accomplished version of Klarsfeld, certainly to you, the audience, I'm trying to make sure that these children will not be forgotten. And, and, and you maybe will explore this work and tell, tell, talk about it to others so their memories certainly and their images um, can live on. And I'm not gonna do this line by line. I'll just show this all at once. And so the first several are, are books. There are two films, some of you may be familiar with, with uh, The Roundup, that's about Valdiv. Jean Reno stars in this, the director Rose Bosch in 2010. The older film, Louis Mal, Au Oir Les Enfants. Uh, very, very good, but I'll, I'll let you be the judge of its goodness or not. Uh, Paris City Hall recently has a digitized collection through Google Arts and Culture, and so it's a digital museum to uh, deported children. And then there's also from the uh, French uh, television radio station, uh, France 24, an interactive map. Uh, interactive in the sense of all the camps and deportation areas in, in France. And so again, I'm not going to click on those now. So I'll, I'll, I will end the screen share, but certainly I hope we have time for questions. Did I do okay? Oh, it's 8.15. You didn't have to do your hand signals. <laughs> you did great. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat box, but there are several thank yous in there. And if you have questions, please put those in the chat box. It was a beautiful presentation and, and thank you for sharing those memories. Well, thank you again for having me and thank you for such a uh, welcoming audience. And we do have several survivors on our, our call. So I wanna give a shout out to those. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very honored by your appearance here. So Thomas Gordon asks, why did it take so long for France to acknowledge the role of the French state in these horrors? There's a book by Henry Russo, I'm pretty sure that's right, in the 19th, late 70s, maybe early 80s. I'm a historian, but sometimes I forget dates. It's called the Vichy Syndrome. And it's not just about the Holocaust, but it's about complicity, Vichy itself, and, and, and the French sort of unwillingness to deal with crimes committed. I'm not going to summarize Russo completely because I haven't read it <clears throat> in a long, long time. But I think part of it is is trying to forget, and I'm not I'm not saying this is right. I, I certainly think it's incorrect that these things let, let's sort of sweep them under the rug, and, and, and certainly at the war's end, 
there's going to be quite a few trials and in some sense summary executions of some of the people involved, you know, not by sort of government entities. But then after that, it, it was almost like a fever for a number of months of retribution and after liberation, August 24th, 1944. But we're going to see those sort of retribution trials sort of end and eventually there'll be formalized trials. And so I think part of it is it's an embarrassment for France. It's an embarrassment for the Fourth Republic. Uh, it's sort of an embarrassment in some sense for de Gaulle, even though de Gaulle was just a free French. He had nothing to do with this. But de Gaulle perhaps wanted to gain some allies from Vichy during his regime. So for him, perhaps up to 1969 and his resignation after the events of 1968, maybe it was a way to keep some of these helpful people compliant. And I think going, going back, I'm kind of working through this through my head. And it's, it's also sadly, you know, why so many Nazi war criminals, if they were a scientist, well, we're, we're not going to charge them because they can be useful. And I'm not trying to be, you know, too irritating here, but to the United States and the Soviet Union, Klaus Barbie was useful to someone. And so he's going to escape uh, immediate trial and consequences until circa 1985. I don't know if that's the best answer, but that's, that's how I would see why it takes so long for the French to admit guilt. Thank you. We also have a question from Carrie Heatherly, and she is asking about the convoy numbers that were referenced for each child. Mm -hmm. She would like to know where those came from and do they have any particular significance beyond just being a number? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so these come from, from Klarsfeld himself. And I think they were probably official French convoy numbers that he is basically getting either from French, they, the uh, National Society of the Railroad, SNCF. And so I'd be fairly sure, but I'm never going to say I'm totally sure. But I would guess, so I'll, I'll use that word, I would guess that these are French numbers that Klarsfeld is faithfully reporting. Because I think he's just good, too good of a historian to just make up his own numbers uh, themselves. And he actually may have found these children starting with the convoy lists. Yes. Searching those out. Uh, also, Tom Gordon has shared that um, an amazing fact that Alfred Dreyfus fought in World War I bravely for his country. Yes. And I think he lives all the way to 1935. It's roughly that era. Any additional questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna call this a close and say thank you so much for this amazing presentation and making us really think and, and remembering these children. Um, it is so important and to learn from what happened to them. Uh, I want to remind everyone to join us on Tuesday, February 16th. We will be having another one of our Bearing Witness programs. This time it will feature Chris Birdie. Chris is an attorney in Birmingham and he was an adolescent before he even was aware that his family had a Holocaust history or that he had Jewish background. Um, so he has been exploring all of this as an adult and so you won't want to miss what he's found out. That's on Tuesday, February the 16th, and just check our website. Thank you all for attending, and I wish you all a good night and good health. Thank you.